it's 11.30 and it's time to uh, begin the webinar. I want to just mention before we go through this, I had asked uh, Joe to uh, uh, to do this webinar for us now, partially before because as he's going to talk about, we may be getting some guidance about what's been going on with MSAs. And as, um, uh, once again, uh, as we were talking about, you know, before the program, some of this, uh, despite the fact that I do a lot of work in this area, sometimes when it comes down to uh, uh, MSAs uh, and compliance, it is uh, a little sometimes hard to get your arms around. Let me just mention before we get started, um, just a little plug for MetaVest. Uh, uh, MetaVest is actually uh, the group that uh, administers our MSA uh, trust for the Golden State Pool Trust. Um, and one of the reasons, quite frankly, that we chose MetaVest is that um, I go to a lot of presentations and I try to learn as much as I can. And uh, consistently, the education that MetaVest puts uh, out, uh, not just from uh, Joe here, but also the entire team, uh, I have found to be incredibly useful. So um, we're taking something that's for me is near impossible to understand um, here. And uh, at least I know that the team I'm working with is keeping really up to date with this. The other thing that's been interesting for me just as, as a trustee of a pool trust is um, um, I understand the premise of MSAs and how it works. Um, we play a little game here um, at the Golden State Pool Trust. So when there's a request made from the MSA Trust and we forward that over to uh, MetaVest, uh, and the game is, is this something that they should pay or is it something they shouldn't pay? And uh, more, more often than not, that we're wrong. So the, um, you know, having folks that are really um, focused on compliance, uh, and spend their time uh, really keeping up on this uh, really gives us at the Golden State Pool Trust here uh, uh, some some assurance that we're doing things uh, correctly. Believe me, from what I've seen, if you try to um, handle these things by common sense, it just doesn't seem to work. So, and Joe, maybe you can correct me, and, and maybe you can get me to the point where uh, I can get my arms around it, but. Um, uh, but that'll be great. Just just one thing with this, and this is part of what I'm hoping you get out of this, uh, is not just going through what um, MSAs and that kind of thing, but there's been a lot of confusion about compliance for years and years and years, and there's a possibility that something may be coming around the corner. Um, and so that's why this is so valuable and timely right now. So anyway, uh, with that, uh, Joe, if you can uh, uh, go on with the program. And what we'll do, if this is OK, is if folks have questions, I'll be monitoring the questions. Um, but I think we'll take most of those when uh, Joe is done with the formal part of the presentation. So anyway, Joe, what can you tell us about um, uh, MSAs and MSP compliance? Yeah, well, thank you, Steve. Um, I, I think, you know, like you mentioned, this is uh, you know, certainly a, a timely um, a piece of information to build into your case flow, especially if you're working in insurance settlements. Um, if some of you have, have kind of uh, butted up against this in the past, um, you know that it's kind of been, like Steve alluded to, kind of a frustrating, very gray, confusing area where you're kind of pulled in multiple directions and you're not really getting any clear guidance or information from Medicare on how to act. Um, and, you know, as recent as February of this year, um, you know, Medicare has shown their intentions to kind of shift their uh, energy and focus from a compliance standpoint into the liability arena. So this is no longer just a work comp uh, issue to work through anymore, which is why I think, um, you know, it's important to uh, prepare to put some strategies together uh, while you go through your case flow and intake um, leading up to October of this year, which we'll get into that. And I want to talk a lot about in the beginning what's new. Um, and then how will that impact, uh, you know, your cases and the way that you work through these issues, um, hopefully to, you know, a favorable settlement and, and of course, uh, maintain eligibility for benefits um, without compromising your settlements. So with that said, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so what is new? There's a change coming 
Um, and the first question I get a lot is, well, wh why now, right? Why, why is this happening? You know, kind of what's the lay of the land here? So if we start from kind of a high 30,000 foot view here as to, you know, some indicators as to why this might be happening, you know, I'm not here to comment about what's happening in Washington, good, bad, or indifferent, and I certainly can't look into a crystal ball and predict exactly what's going to happen from a budgetary standpoint, but if you keep a tab on what's happening, um, you know, as far as proposals for budgets and, and you know, where interests are concerned, we see that potentially it's, it's not out of uh, the realm to see that we might be facing almost an 18% reduction in a, in a very important budget that we all have to work with it. So what does that mean for us? Um, kind of the attitude that's been taken is entitlement based programs for some, you know, half the country that's a very dirty word and it's very difficult to talk about um, expanding that budget or, or committing you know, uh, more dollars to that budget and, and distributing them however you see fit. Um, that's a difficult tax. So what we're seeing happening is the approach of a dollar saved is a dollar earned. We see that the strength of recovery rights um, and all benefit programs are, are being, you know, really ramped up and they're really attacking this and, and focusing on this. So when we kind of continue to dwindle it on down to Medicare, um, we have this federal statute that's been lingering out there since 1980 that's essentially saying no double dipping, um, but nothing's really been done to enforce that from a compliance perspective. Well, those days are changing and the very first thing um, to start that process uh, is this change request that um, is kind of probably been flying around the internet and listservs and blogs and all that good stuff. Um, you know, Steve and I were talking before we started this and, you know, some people probably loosely refer to this as, well, oh, well CMS released a memo, right, that, they, that they, you know, noted their intentions to give us guidance on liability MSAs. And it, it's technically a change request that Medicare sent to their contractors. Now, the reason why that's important is because step one of this whole process is Medicare is saying that they want to have on board by October 1st of this year the ability to manipulate what they refer to as their common working file, which is just a, a way to a gather data. Uh, it's, a pool of, it's a pool of data with a bunch of data fields to, to track manipulate information. They want to be able to fold into that now information about liability settlements, liability MSAs. What's the dollar figure for an MSA? Was one even done? What are the injuries that go into contemplating the MSA? What are the medical codes? What are the fee schedules used? So on and so forth. Why is that important for us now? Well, we see that if they're building that dead, if they're if they're building those data fields, and they want to have this up and running by October first, which we'll see if that happens. Um, now, Medicare will have teeth, essentially stronger teeth, a pool of data to track, analyze, and enforce compliance with this federal statute, which I'll go through a timeline to get us, you know, how how we got here, but they will have the means now to manipulate information to say, was John Doe or Jane Smith, uh, you know, should they have had a Medicare set aside done? Should they have had some other source of payment than the Medicare trust fund to pay for those injury related expenses going forward? So the Medicare trust fund isn't the primary payer. And that's kind of the, the overarching idea behind this whole MSP compliance um, issue that's kind of turned into a cottage industry, to be honest where you are, you're trying to prevent from double dipping. This was a, uh, an issue created to prevent, you know, uh, or to work towards solvency issues with the trust fund. So what's important is, you know, and I'll send out this, uh, this change request to Steve and he can distribute it to um, anybody that's interested so they have it handy. But on the first two pages, it specifically names liability MSAs. It does not say you know, a payment from some other source other than Medicare. It talks specifically about crafting liability MSAs, Medicare set-asides. It also specifically names the federal statute, um, which the federal statute, I don't know if you can see my pointer here, but this 1980 Medicare secondary payer statute, that's a federal statute that essentially says no double dipping. And this is where this whole industry sprouts from. There, in the statute, it names five plans of insurance that are deemed primary to Medicare, and one of those five plans is liability insurance. So we've been 
living in this world where we have a federal statute lingering out there that specifically names liability as a primary payer and then we don't have any form of guidance at all on how to protect Medicare's interest as a secondary payer. We have a bunch of memos um, in the work comp space but nothing about liability. We have a couple letters that have been written over the years from uh, directors within Medicare that comments about well the federal statute applies both to comp and liability so you must do something which everybody else immediately follows up with well can you tell us what that something looks like and that's when they go dark and they have no guidance we find ourselves in the situation now where we're seeing that Medicare is taking the steps to track and enforce compliance on the liability side with the implement implementation of these new data fields for specifically the, the, the liability Medicare set aside but yet in this change notice we still don't have concrete rules and guides and that's a big question that, that, I, that, that I get a lot in a lot of conversations I'm having about well what is this new change that we got and that's why I wanted to call attention to the fact that this is not a memo from Medicare it was a, a change request sent to their contractors so they could you know re, rebuild uh, basically their infrastructure to take on these new data fields so very quickly I want to just give a, a quick summation uh, kind of a timeline on how we got here to this point now um, in case you know this whole issue of MSP compliance isn't um, uh, you know very very well known for the folks that are joining us here. So 65 Medicare trust funds created. Um, little known fact, uh, work comp was the only line of insurance that was considered primary to Medicare when it was created. Not not many people knew that, and in fact, nothing was done about that for a very long time. Which lead us down to 1980. Medicare trust funds having solvency issues, we still do now to this day, you know, some things don't change, but they create the Medicare secondary payer statute again. It's a federal statute that says no double dipping. What it does is names five plans of insurance that are going to be considered primary, so Medicare is thereby protected as a secondary payer status for a two-prong test, injury-related expenses, and they must be otherwise Medicare allowable expenses, right? Medicare pays for a lot of things, but they don't pay for everything. So if you have a comp claim over someone's low back, right, going forward, if your settlement uh, contemplates future medical care, then for those items related to the low back and Medicare allowable items for the low back would need to be paid for out of a form of a Medicare set aside so that Medicare trust fund just doesn't keep picking up the tab. That's kind of the conceptual idea behind this. From 1980 to 2001, there's 21 years of inactivity. It was essentially the scout's honor rule. Uh, nothing was done for, for uh, enforcing compliance or, or tracking to see if anything was done at all. It was scout's honor. Uh, May of 2001, because of that, and we're still heading towards insolvency insol issues, uh, the Government Accountability Office recommends uh, for a mandatory insure reporting process. Um, what's important here for this piece is, um, for all of you that are, that are joining us or listening in, the mandatory insurer reporting is a burden placed on the payer. There is no duty to perform for plaintiff counsel. However, with that known, it's very important to advise your plaintiff attorney clients that though they don't have to technically do anything with this mandatory insurer reporting, they need to know and be mindful that Medicare is getting their clients claim information whether they like it or not because of this reporting requirement that carriers have to submit claim information on up to Medicare. Now this started as a handful of data fields and it's it's totally ballooned uh, and been bloated into well over 100 data fields and now with this new change request from February yeah, there's, we're going to get even more of them and they're going to be specific to liability MSA. So what's very important is that Medicare has a, a way, you know, a pool of data to track and analyze and enforce compliance. Now, in, in you know, February 2017, they're putting us all on notice through their contractors to say, we're going to strengthen this way to enforce compliance with regard to the MSP statute and, and set-asides because we're now going to create data fields to make sure we have some information on was there a set-aside done? How much was a set-aside for compared to the global settlement? What were the medical codes used? What were the injuries? So on and so forth. In July of 2001, uh, Medicare issues the Patel memo, essentially endorsing, creating, quasi-creating Medicare set-asides. There was actually uh, an attorney out of the uh, Colorado area that came up with the concept of a set-aside. 
which is basically just a carve out from your global settlement that is money earmarked for injury related and otherwise Medicare allowable expenses. So you use that sum of money going forward as your primary payer source and Medicare is thereby protected as, as the secondary payer. It's important to note here because the Medicare set aside is just a compliance tool. Now I want to draw attention to this and, and highlight because there's a lot of misinformation that swirls around in this whole MSA issue. Medicare set-asides are not mandatory. There's never a situation, time, or trigger where you are compelled to do a Medicare set-aside. However, I, I want to, to urge caution when, when you start talking around these types of issues because that is not quite the right question. And there was, in fact, um, a case out of Arizona recently that, that swirled all this up all over again. I believe it was a, the Burl case. Um, and if anybody wants to read through that, you know, look it up on the Internet or, or send me an email and, and I can send you a, a, a breakdown. But essentially, they asked the courts, do we have to do an MSA? And what they meant was, you know, when, is, when should we protect Medicare's interests and how do we do that? And, and do we have to protect Medicare's interests? But what they said was, do we have to do an MSA? Well, remember, Medicare set-asides are just a compliance tool. It's a means to an end, right? It's a way to protect uh, Medicare as a secondary payer via the federal statute, the MSP statute. So the courts did exactly what all of us would do. They looked back through and saw, well, there's, there's really nothing that's ever, that ever states when you have to do an MSA. So the answer was no. Well, that caused a lot of problems because it wasn't quite the right question. The right question is, when do we have triggers when Medicare must be protected as a secondary payer? That's the right question to ask. Now, from this um, you know, July 2001 timeline piece right here, the Medicare set-aside is the only compliance tool that's ever been weighed in on and accepted by Medicare as satisfactory to them because they understand it and it works for them. That does not mean you can do, that you can't do anything else. It just means that from a risk appetite standpoint, you know that if you do a Medicare set-aside or some iteration of one, which we'll kind of get into in a moment, they're not widgets, um, especially for liability cases, that's, that's doing the, the most conservative thing you can in the way of protecting Medicare to secondary payer and ultimately protecting your client's access to their Medicare benefits, which is why we go through this whole process to begin with. From 2001 to present day, CMS issues more memos further defining Medicare set-asides. As I mentioned earlier, all the guidance that we have is specifically related and written for the work comp arena. We have a couple of lingering articles out there from Medicare representatives that, that basically reaffirm that though there is no guidance for liability MSAs, the federal statute holds true that liability is considered a primary payer um, and thereby has to protect Medicare as a secondary payer, but then they push it off on the rest of us and say, well, you figure out how you want to do that. So we don't really have any clear-cut guidance, and remember, this uh, change notice is not technically a memo, it's just a change request to their contractors. And, uh, letting them know that by October 1st they want to be able to have the data fields in place to uh, manipulate information and track information with specific regard for liability Medicare set-asides. December 2007, former President Bush signs the Medicare, Medicaid, and SCHIP Extension Act of 2007. Uh, the SCHIP Extension Act, for purposes of what we're talking about today, really has next to nothing to do with, with uh, MSAs. It's kind of one of those times where you, in the 11th hour, you hitch something onto a bill and get it pushed through, and that was this. This um, that's what happened here. This is um, the uh, ability for that mandatory insurer reporting to be. It was kind of the evolution of of that to where what's important now, as I talk to you in here in July of 2017, the the rec reporting requirement for carriers is in full effect. So that's why, as I said earlier, it's very important to advise your plaintiff attorney clients that though this is no uh, burden placed on them to perform in any way, they must be mindful that that Medicare is receiving their client's claim information whether they like it or not because of this reporting requirement that's placed on insurance carriers. Okay, so that's kind of a timeline on how we got to be here. There's basically two pieces of law that are driving this little world that we live in. The first one is that um, federal statute, the 1980 MSP federal statute, right, that, that says no double dipping essentially that there's five primary plans of insurance. One of those is explicitly named as liability, right? And then we also have that uh, mandatory insurer reporting requirement as that second piece that's kind of driving this where that was kind of the genesis of 
Medicare to be able to create a pool of data to track, analyze, and enforce compliance. And since then, things have, have begun to evolve. So since we're talking specifically about liability MSAs today, I wanted to give a little bit of a timeline that, that gives you uh, an overview of any piece of commentary that Medicare has ever released on liability MSA. So again, we have the federal statute starting on the bottom left. We have the reporting requirement in 2009. We, in 2012, we have an announcement for public rulemaking. Now this is kind of the process that you have to go through when you're considering making any kind of uh, you know, policy changes. So in 2012, they said, okay, we want to, we are going to uh, potentially have some rules, some guidance that we're going to give in the liability arena because they've been flooded with, you know, with a plea to please give us some guidance on, on how to do this. Um, and later in 2012, um, in, in August, they had a comment period that they were inundated and flooded from every, every trade association industry business that, that plays in this space. Everybody had something to say in their own opinion on how they should do it. Um, 2014, in October of 2014, those proposed rules were withdrawn. Um, I can vividly remember um, that's about the time that uh, you know the uh, the Stetson conference goes on, um, and there was a lot of discussion about well, what happens now since we thought we were going to get rules um, on liability MSAs and they were pulled off the table. Why were they pulled off the table? What happened? What's that going to mean for us? The world that we live in today. There's a lot of speculation on why those rules were pulled. Um, no one knows for certain. There's speculation as trivial as it just lingered out there for too long and they need to go back to the drawing board. There's speculation as significant as they did economic impact studies and said the ripple effect would be catastrophic. We can't use these types of rules. No one knows for certain, but we don't, ha we don't have proposed rules yet. This change request in, in um, February of 2017, the last uh, bullet here, is just that. It's a change request talking about adding information uh, to the common working file, which is their, their kind of the host for all the claim information and data. They're going to amend that common working file to include data points for liability Medicare, Medi liability Medicare set-asides um, and the uh, medical codes and information that go along with the Medicare set-asides themselves. So. Um, what does this mean? It's still kind of, you know, it's unfortunate because we haven't quite crossed the finish line yet from getting guidance, right? We have Medicare moving in a direction now saying that they're going to really uh, strengthen their ability to um, uh, enforce compliance on the liability side, especially with liability Medicare. However, though, they have yet to give us actual concrete guidance, kind of a scaffolding on the way that we can operate in this space. It's still left up to, you know, all the stakeholders in your settlements. So as far as MSP compliance is concerned, I wanted to give some practical uh, steps that you could hopefully build into your caseload process knowing that we kind of have covered the background on, you know, Medicare set-asides and protecting Medicare as a secondary payer, why we must do that, the federal statute, there's no clear-cut guidance yet on liability MSAs. However, this new information that came in February, it's supposed to go into effect in October of this year, is uh, clearly demonstrating their, their, their strong and strengthened intentions to uh, create compliance on liability set-asides. So what, what does that do? What does that mean for us while we're working through our cases on a day-by-day -day basis? So the first step would be verifying um, who are the players? You know, who are the, who, what government benefits, if any, are involved in your case, right? So you can do um, an inquiry, uh, a, formal in a formal inquiry, or if uh, time's of the essence and it's an option, I know it's not always an option with some of uh, the clients and, and plaintiff attorney counsel, they can go to ssa.gov and they can have the claimant create a profile and almost instantly they can get a benefits verification letter. That's ssa.gov, create a profile, and they can get a benefits verification letter. That letter will tell them any and all government benefits that they have access to so that you can contemplate all of those things while you're putting together a game plan with a pending settlement. Um, if that's not an option for having them go and create a profile, um, a traditional uh, way is to have a, a status check inquiry done by you know tons of vendors out there. Um, what that inquiry will do is, again, is tell you 
what benefits, if any, are involved. Now, with regard to SSDI, I want to um, pause and, and call attention to the difference between SSI and SSDI. SSI is an asset-based program, uh, nothing to do with Medicare. SSDI, the reason why it's a trigger for Medicare is because the way that the program is set up, after a two-year period, you get rolled onto the Medicare program. So Medicare takes the conservative view that anyone that has access to Social Security disability benefits, they will soon be coming onto their program and they'd like to see something done to protect their interests as a secondary payer. One other thing that I'd like to call, uh, call attention to um, with this process of getting access to SSDI, if any of you have experience with this, you, you, you uh, will, will probably uh, remember these stories. For whatever reason, the way that the program works is the first time you know you apply, more often than not, you'll you'll get a denial. Um, you have a a window for appeals um, that you can go through to fight for your benefits, and you can actually have a second appeals process, and you can also go so far down the line to you know hire a disability benefits attorney, get a date on the you know a court date on the books, and go fight to have your disability benefits um, you know given to you. The reason why I bring this up. Medicare takes the view, the very conservative view, that if you have an application for SSDI benefits created and open, they will want to see a, a set-aside done because they will assume that any application that is open or pending will ultimately get access to those benefits, which will then be a trigger. Secondly, the way that the program works is, let's say you apply in August of, of 2016, you finally get your benefits in July of 2017. When those benefits are granted, they are retroactive, meaning they go back to the date of your first application. So that's very important to, to think about when we go through this first step is don't just quickly say, you know, ask them, you know, what benefits they have because they, they might be uncertain or they might mix up SSI or SSDI or, or something like that, but also it's very important to know where we're at in that application process for SSDI benefits if they've opened one up. Step two. So for purposes of today, we'll say in step one, you know, the, we have identified a need to protect Medicare's interests as a secondary payer. Um, the common triggers are age, right, 65 or 62 and a half because you're 30 months out from being on Medicare. That's the window that, that Medicare is given to say we'd like to see something done to protect our interests. So 62 and a half, of course 65 via age, or Social Security disability, that's the biggest way that you can, uh, I don't want to say prematurely, but you can get access to Medicare earlier than, than, what, than what's considered normal. There's a couple of, uh, there's a handful of, of kind of one-off, very unique situations uh, like Lou Gehrig's disease, end-stage renal disease, things like that, um, but that should be pretty, you know, a, a apparent, you know, when you are engaged to, you know, to, to assist on, on, a, on a file like that. So in step one, what government benefits, if any, are, are, do we have to contemplate? Um, we've talked about the triggers for protecting Medicare as a secondary payer. Now we talk about taking one step further and talking about addressing future medicals, right? Because these MSA accounts are 100% medical money. That means it's going to be all money that's kind of predestined or been pre-spent in a way um, for future medical care that the individual will likely need. Now the, the, the piece of this that becomes, you know, kind of um, not, not necessarily difficult, but something that's very important when you're, when you're working within a, a liability settlement is, you know, you don't ever want to hoard too much money into these accounts and, and leave the rest of the settlement and the other areas or the buckets to fill, per se, um, you know, with, with un, underfunded. Um, you also want to make sure that the individual is going to get the, the right kind of care that they need. Um, but there's all sorts of things that go into how you can how you can make that work given you know the the space and the unique circumstances that you're working within for your your cases. So let's start about first with what's required versus what's not required. Remember, MSAs are never required themselves, but it's the preferred vehicle for protecting Medicare's interests as a secondary payer. If we're choosing to do some form of a Medicare set aside, what we must do is demonstrate a reasonable and adequate consideration of Medicare's interest. That's the language that's used. You can see how that's very vague and open to into interpretation, and that's where a lot of that gray fog comes from because they have yet to give us clear, concrete, step-by-step -step, um, rules, if you will, that, that, there's, that uh, we have yet to get from Medicare. Um, protect Medicare as a secondary payer for injury-related and 
Medicare allowable expenses. Remember, what goes into the MSAs, they're not general medical slush funds. They're very, very specific and narrow in what they can contemplate, and it's, it's really a two-pronged test. Is it injury-related, and is it something that Medicare would otherwise pay for? What's voluntary? Submitting MSAs for review. Now, there's also a lot of misinformation and gray fog around this idea of submitting MSAs for review. Here's the facts. Submitting MSAs for a review, regardless if it's a work comp claim or a liability MSA, always 100% voluntary. There is a, a 2011 CMS memo that uh, memorializes this, that they say this is simply just a um, additional option available to utilize if you would like Medicare to uh, review and ultimately give their opinion on what's a reasonable and adequate amount to set aside from your settlement. We see that CMS submission is commonly used in work comp claims, but for purposes of liability cases, strongly, strongly, strongly advise do not submit those MSAs for approval, and I'll get into that for a moment. Professional administration, never mandated, never forced. However, it is the most crucial aspect of Medicare secondary compliance. Uh, case in point, if you go through this whole process, right, you go through this whole process because your end game is protecting Medicare and protecting your client's access to Medicare benefits, right? That's why we go through this process. We see if we look back on Medicare's behavior and their actions from enforcing compliance, we see that as I talk to you today, there's never been one case out there where you have, let's just say hypothetically, a $50,000 MSA, the case settles, uh, CMS audits it, comes back and says that $50,000, we think it should have been 75, and now we have problems and it's a whole you know, ball of wax that nobody wants to get involved with. However, what we do see Medicare doing, and with a uh, higher and increased frequency, you take that same exact example, the $50,000 MSA, case settles, Medicare goes, okay, I've granted you that you've done something reasonable and adequate to protect our interests as secondary payer, you have a set aside done, but I want to know how you're spending that money down. Where's that money going? You know, how was it spent? What were the items? What are your injured body parts? What were the medical codes used? What were the fee schedules? Where do you live? Who's your representation? Those are all administration questions, right? That's all about what are you doing with that amount of money post settlement and how are you making distribution decisions? Um, you know, Steve kind of, you know, uh, alluded to early before we started this all off, you know, that, that hit his office, they kind of have, you know, a, a game where when bills come in, they go, okay, well, the, was the MSA going to pay for this? Is it not? From a compliance standpoint, for all the stakeholders involved, it's the best thing that you can do for your client and for yourself to decrease exposure to have these, M have these MSAs administered because Medicare is explicit when they say whoever is holding the MSA funds is on the hook for compliance. There is no sliding scale of forgiveness if you're a professional or a fiduciary or you know, an, an aunt or a cousin or someone just trying to do somebody a solid. If the rules are the same. So if compliance we see historically from Medicare's perspective is more so about how you're spending that money down post-settlement, which is a problem to be solved through administration, and also we see that really compliance in um, understanding where, where the potential exposure lies, that can be served, the professional administration can be utilized almost as a risk transfer for all the stakeholders involved in your settlement to say, okay, we're going to hire a professional to administer this MSA because that's, that's what they do, that's their core competency, but at the same time, we'll guarantee that your client's Medicare benefits won't be jeopardized, you'll have point of recourse if there's something that actually happens because the, the administrator will be Continuing on the line of addressing future medicals, um, just kind of some, some pointers uh, that you can just kind of keep in the back of your head when, whenever you're confronted with an MSA issue and you're going uh, through the exercises of, you know, what should this MSA look like. When you're addressing future medicals, think about the timeline, right? When we, we have to allocate expenses to someone's life expectancy, but we don't want to use their, the, you know, the traditional life tables. So, when you have an individual and you're going to be utilizing a Medicare set-aside, it's very important that you have a rated age used. And what a rated age does is it takes into account everything involved with the individual. Pre-existing conditions, things from the accident, uh, you know, family histories, you name it. 
and life, life companies do medical underwriting on the individual and come back with what's called a rated age. An example would be if an individual, their chronological age is 64 years old, but given their pre-existing conditions, family histories, and injuries sustained for this lawsuit, um, they have a rated age of 74, right? So, you've just, so from a, a, a timeline perspective, when you're making allocation decisions for this MSA, you've just shrunk the timeline to, put medical be, to, to allocate medical expenses by 10 years because now you have a rated age to use as opposed to someone's chronological age. Frequencies. Think about how often somebody gets drug refills. Think about how often they may need to get a, you know, a revision surgeries or x-rays or things of that nature. These are things that we are building into the MSA and every time that you put in something into the allocation, there's going to be a dollar figure put behind it. The items themselves. Generally speaking, remember the, the big rule. It has to be injury related. Sometimes we can get into some tricky issues, um, you know, where it's, you know, did one thing exacerbate another? Did one thing cause another? Again, those are, those are exercises that, that typically you can have somebody produce a set aside report for you um, in conjunction with your other, you know, materials like life care plans and things of that nature that can address what the actual kind of future medical care the individual is going to be looking at. Maximizing settlement funds, right? We never, I've never really found myself in a situation where someone says, I have too much money to, to you know, use, where do I put it all? We're always doing the opposite, where we're trying to do the best with what we have. Um, think about compressing the cost of care. Medicare, from a compliance standpoint, give you this example. If somebody needs a wheelchair going forward because of the accident that happened to them, Medicare doesn't care if you pay $5 or $5,000 for that wheelchair. They just need to make sure that the Medicare trust fund doesn't pick up the tab for that and for any other injury-related expenses. So taking that concept about what does it cost to procure those medical needs and expenses, that's something to be mindful of that you can work with somebody to be able to deliver great care to your clients, but maybe you can get that all procured for you know, a lower cost, which is going to allow you to redistribute settlement funds elsewhere, maybe into a special needs trust, um, maybe somewhere else into the settlement and you know, the family needs money for something else. Or when you go through your settlement planning, right, and you're getting a full you know, idea of, of what uh, the individual and the family's needs are, if they were the you know, primary earner and all those types of things, it's going to be even more important to be as responsible as possible on setting aside an appropriate amount, but never overfunding these accounts so you can redistribute settlement funds elsewhere and maximize those dollars. Funding these accounts. Very quickly, we don't need to go you know, deep into this, but just conceptually keep in the back of your mind, you have a sum of money. Do you fund it with cash or can you maybe fund it with an annuity? Um, a lot of times, you know, the idea of, of you know, annuities and settlements can, can get a little contentious, and, um, but here's, here's kind of an olive branch for if there's multiple stakeholders in the settlement. It's always a good idea to consider having these MSA accounts funded with an annuity. Couple reasons. Number one, if you have $100,000 set aside, instead of taking $100,000 off the top of your settlement and parking it into an account and saying that's my MSA, maybe you can purchase a, 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 an annuity that, you know, maybe it costs, you know, $80,000 today but pays out the $100,000 over their lifetime, well, you've just opened up $20,000 to use elsewhere into the settlement. That's, that, that, that's a win for everybody. Secondly, what does Medicare think? Medicare is actually a champion for having annuities used to fund Medicare set-asides account, though their intentions are a little bit different. In their eyes, if you look through the guidebook for Medicare set-asides, and again, all the guidance so far is for work comp MSAs, but nonetheless, in their guidebook, when they go through an example of funding an MSA, they use an annuity. The reason why they like annuities is because the vast majority of MSAs out there are self-administered, um, which means you have a layperson trying to go at this the best way they can. And remember, I want to call back your attention to when com from compliance, is it more so about what's the right magic number, which I don't want to belittle that, it's important, or is it more important from a compliance standpoint about distribution decisions and how you spend that money down. We see by monitoring Medicare's behavior and actions, it's more so about spending how you spend that money down in distribution decisions as long as you do something reasonable and adequate and defensible on the set-aside portion.
So if you have all these, if you have, you know, injured lay people trying to self-administer their own MSA, even if they're making a good faith effort, they're, they're going to find themselves out of compliance. So Medicare says, well, if you can use an annuity and you have 20 installments coming to you, you know, if you blow through the first, you know, annuity stream, well, you have 19 more tries to get it right as opposed to getting, you know, a large sum of money and you can immediately spin through it. Um, ensuring post-settlement in medical care. I remember, professional administration is the cornerstone of compliance. It's the cornerstone of compliance from Medicare standpoint. They, they care more about doing something reasonable and adequate uh, pre-settlement, finding a set-aside amount that, that works, but they're more so concerned with making sure that money gets spent appropriately post-settlement so they don't just immediately get put back onto Medicare and Medicare is being the primary payer for items. Um, professional administration also is a risk transfer for all the stakeholders involved in the settlement because whoever's holding those MSA funds is responsible for compliance and it has a duty to perform any kind of audit that Medicare may, may come up with uh, with regard to how the MSA was created or how the MSA has been spent down. Um, a flow chart, uh, believe me, I'm not asking any of you to, to be able to read through this, but I want to make this available as well. Um, I want to give you guys, you know, some, some tangible things here to just shove in a drawer and next time this pops up, you'll have some resources. So um, I'll send this to Steve as well. Um, and, you know, I'll give you the, the change request notice from Medicare in February. I'll also include the flow chart for you to have handy. Um, and this flow chart on the top half here, it's a quick little um, question, you know, uh, to direct you. Do I need to consider having an MSA done? Closing future medicals? Yes. Is Indivil 62 and a half? They have access to SSDI um, insurance? Yes or no? Follow, yes, Medicare set aside is recommended or no, then you can move forward. Now, remember we talked about in step one with SSDI benefits, remember it's important that we know where they're at in that application process. Successful MSP compliance is the adequate consideration, the set aside amount, right? Something reasonable and adequate, and with it, administration. Um, CMS submission, I touched on this earlier. Again, 100% voluntary. Um, there's a 2011 memo from CMS that memorializes that it's completely voluntary. You're never compelled to submit MSAs for approval. I also want to um, call your attention to the review thresholds that Medicare has. I know it, it's common, again, with kind of a, a, some misinformation swirling around where these review thresholds are mistakenly used as triggers for when to think about having an MSA done. And that's not, that they're, that's not what they're intended for. That's not the same. Uh, an MSA should be considered if the individual 62 and a half, they're 65, if they have access to SSDI, end-stage renal disease, Lou Gehrig's disease, those are the things that you need to think about as triggers to maybe I need to think about having an MSA done. And then from there, you can build them out and craft them in a number of different ways to fit your case. These review thresholds have nothing to do with should I think about having an MSA done. These review thresholds are simply in place so that Medicare just doesn't receive every single MSA out there for review. They have to hit these thresholds to be eligible to participate in a review program. And again, these are just for work comp and, and the, uh, you never have to submit them, especially for liability. In fact, I strongly recommend you don't submit these MSAs for approval, um, primarily for the main reason, not just because you don't have to, but from a cost-benefit standpoint. Let's say you, everybody has a meeting of the minds around $100,000 for uh, a set-aside, and it works, and it fits within everything else that's happening. If you were to submit that MSA off for approval, first and foremost, chances are it probably wouldn't get reviewed. And, and, and gone really are the days where they would even send you a letter back to say, at this time, we're not reviewing liability, MSA, so on and so forth. At least for now, that's the world we live in today. Um, so it's, it's kind of a, a, a waste of time for everybody. But the most important reason, from a cost-benefit standpoint, you, if you had submitted that $100,000 MSA, and on the off chance on a Tuesday afternoon, a contractor decides to pick it up because they could, and they reviewed it, chances are it will come back with what they call a counter hire. Remember, these contractors are understaffed, underpaid, undereducated, and all they're there to do is make sure that Medicare gets its quote-unquote pound of flesh. And they have no interest at all in making your life easier and every interest in making sure that, if anything, there's enough money or too much money available so Medicare doesn't have to pick up the tab 
at a, a earlier rate post settlement. So that means these counter hires, if you submitted that MSA at hundred thousand dollars, chances are it could come back. I mean, five, ten, fifteen, thirty percent higher. I mean, we we all there's there, there's horror stories. Trust me. And if you've worked with MSAs on the comp side, chances are you you've heard of them too. But the bottom line is, you don't have to submit them. It, it it's it's not needed from a cost benefit standpoint. It, it's it's taking on a risk that you don't need to take on. And then the last reason, again, from decreasing your exposure and doing the right thing by your client, you can have these MSAs administered, and that will cover not having a piece of paper from Medicare saying giving their stamp of approval on a set aside, which they would probably inflate anyways, and perhaps compromise your pending settlement. So step three, if I haven't beaten this dead horse already, proper administration. Step one, what government benefits, if any, are involved? Do I need to think about having an MSA done? Step two. You can, we can get through the, the mechanics of building out these MSAs just for today. Remember that they're not widgets. There's both an art and a science to them, um, especially on the liability side. You're going to take into consideration a number of things um, that you don't have to think about on work comp claims when you're building out these MSAs. Mostly things like comparative negligence, uh, policy issues, those will all have a major impact on your MSAs. We could spend a whole other webinar on just considerations for building out MSAs but that's step two, have the MSA done. Step three, have it professionally administered. These are the requirements. Um, I'm just gonna go through them pretty quick here because they are what they are. There's not much to explain, but these are actual, the CMS requirements that Medicare has in place for anyone that's uh, administering the MSA. Um, you'll just have them handy if you ever need to quickly reference them on the requirements for administration. Um, it, that always cracks me up, that third one, that uh, account maintenance fees like photocopying and postage and whatnot can be paid from the MSA, but the fees for administration cannot be paid for out of the MSA. It's, it's mind-blowing. Um, we've been working on that for years. Um, our trade associations and, and all have been trying to uh, create change for that because we, we've shown them the numbers, and it doesn't make sense from Medicare standpoint. They just say, well, we don't want to allow administration fees to come from the MSA because every single dollar must be used for medical expenses. But we have shown them the information that a, a challenge to having these MSAs administered are the fees. And if you allow the fees to come out of the MSA, you're essentially allowing a whole industry of compliance partners to do their job. And through it, professional administration, you would keep and stretch and preserve those MSA counts for a heck of a lot longer than if a layperson was managing it and you're achieving your end game, which is keeping those people off of the Medicare trust fund for an extended period of time. But yet, it falls on deaf ears, and, and we still are in this space today. Um, the requirements um, upon death, this is a, a common question. What happens if there's money left in the account um, when uh, an individual, when the owner of the account passes away? Um, Really, there's two times money's coming out on an allowable expense, or if the individual passes away, the money will go to you know wherever they can dictate an estate, deemed beneficiary, whomever. Um, that window of 15 to 27 months is not hard and fast. Uh, generally, you would any administrator likes to keep the account open for a period of time after death because it's easier to pay for trickling claims as they come in, as opposed to relinquishing the funds. However, that's not impossible. Um, you can you can relinquish the funds um, just about on any timetable. Temporary exhaustion versus permanent exhaustion. Remember thinking about the idea of uh, funding the accounts with cash or funding the accounts with an annuity. Temporary exhaustion is when you have annual annuity payments coming in to, to uh, uh, replenish the MSA account and, and make sure that there's cash there to pay for items. Let's say somebody has an expensive year because medical needs are always voluntary. Things go up and down. Health goes up and down. If the annuity payment comes in in January of 2017, they've been, it's been spent down completely by July of 2017. The next payment doesn't come in until next January. This is called temporary exhaustion. Um, you're, this is also a major benefit to having an administrator involved. Um, Whoever is handling the account must put Medicare on notice of temporary exhaustion. If they do it correctly, Medicare will intervene in surface as the primary payer, not on a lien basis. I get that question a lot. They will surface temporarily as the primary payer and pay for uh, all Medicare allowable expenses. Once the next annuity installment comes in, I think it was January in our example, 
then Medicare will you put them on notice again and say, okay, the account is liquid once again. This is the primary payer source. Medicare will, will go back down to being number two in line, and you'll be held accountable to pay for uh, injury-related Medicare allowable expenses appropriately um, and spend that money down the way that it should be. And that's the crux of that, where before they surface as the primary payer, it will be kind of like a quasi audit to say, well, how did you get down to zero, right? Did you did you buy a Mustang or did you just use general medical care or somewhere in between? That could create problems. Um, permanent exhaustion. That's when the MSA account has been spent down to zero. There is no more funding coming. The set aside amount that was deemed reasonable and adequate has been spent down entirely. That is when you put Medicare on notice to to say that you know you had a set aside. Um, created to protect them as secondary payer. You allow them one last look, right? They look back and say, and if they agree that everything's been spent down appropriately, then Medicare will will assume the primary payer position indefinitely, and you preserve their their Medicare benefits uh, uh, correctly. Uh, again, the whole reason why we go through this whole process, right, is to make sure that Medicare is available for our clients and beneficiaries. Paying those medical bills, you can kind of break it down very quickly into three three little prongs. Injury related, is it direct? Is it indirect? Was it exacerbated? We have to consider these things. Medicare allowable, um, Medicare set asides only contemplate futures, so it has nothing to do with liens or conditional payments. Um, those terms are interchangeable, but today we're not talking about liens. We're only talking about futures. Um, but with regard to um, these expenses. It's also important to make sure that you're capturing the right things. You know, we don't want to uh, allocate and account for things that have already maybe been, you know, procedures or visits or or something like that that's already, you know, done. It's already happened. So it's just assessing accurately future medical needs. Um, pricing for liability cases, typically it's usual and customary. If any of you have experience on UC pricing, it's sky high. It's like retail. Um, that's another way if you can utilize an administrator, you can really you know, compress the, the cost of care and you can work with people that have the ability to procure medical goods and services at a steep, steep discount and then you can allocate using those preferred rates as long as you can guarantee that you can procure the item for that rate. And again, that's a great way to help redistribute and compress these MSA accounts as much as possible um, safely without rubbing up against any gray lines. So um, that's about it for today. Um, I guess I will leave you with thinking about what's new. We have this policy, um, this change request, where it's not technically a memo. Um, it's Medicare putting their contractors on notice that they would like to see or they're expecting to see by October 1st um, data fields created in their common working file to um, capture liability Medicare set-aside um, information like the, the totals, the size of it, the medical um, uh, codes and, and all those items. They're doing that as a way to make sure now that um, individuals aren't prematurely putting future medicals on the Medicare trust fund. The whole idea of a Medicare set aside is to have a carve out for, for futures so that Medicare is, is number two and protected. The MSAs contemplate injury related and Medicare allowable expenses. It's not a general medical slush fund. And there's a bunch of ways to craft MSAs, especially on liability set-asides. So when you're thinking about going through one, work with somebody that can help shepherd you through that process and do the best thing given the circumstances of the case. And lastly, the cornerstone of, of MSP compliance in totality is professional administration. It serves as a risk transfer. It serves as a guarantee for the stakeholders involved. And it does the best thing by the beneficiary, both from a, a quality of life, ease of use issue, but also as a protective mechanism um, for them as well and making sure they have access to their Medicare benefits. So I'll leave it at that. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions or considerations. Um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm happy to do what I can. So just tying this up, uh, uh, Joe, and if the folks do have questions, you're welcome to post them here and I'll read them off. Um, going back to this, now one thing about um, MSAs and all that is, um, if you have funds in an MSA, does it protect, uh, is that counted for your SSI, Medicaid, that kind of thing? Yeah, so great question. So if we're working with, um, you know, uh, a claimant that's considered dual eligible, where there is, you know, Medicaid or SSI, 
involved as well as uh, Medicare SSDI. Um, chances are there'll be a special needs trust that's set up. The Medicare set aside, no matter how large or small it is, is considered a is considered accountable asset. So in order not to jeopardize those asset based benefits, we need to make sure that that Medicare set aside is embedded um, within the special needs trust, almost as like a sub trust, where we make sure that those funds, although they're in the special needs trust, there there is kind of a carve out within that trust for those injury-related and Medicare allowable expenses. And uh, uh, once again, the Golden State Pool Trust does have an MSA trust now um, uh, because we uh, do things a little differently. We have it as a totally separate trust. Uh, so if you have somebody that comes in with an MSA uh, piece of their settlement, the MSA part will go in the MSA trust, the rest will go into the special needs trust. Um, also, Joe did cover um, uh, this in the program that we did uh, in Los Angeles about a year ago on court order trust. So for those folks that are interested um, in reviewing that in the details, once again, you can go to gspt.org uh, and it should be on that website. So, um, so Joe, that's, um, uh, once again, we're waiting um, uh, here uh, for more um, guidance from CMS on this, and it may be forthcoming, it may not be, but I know this is a, an area of huge um, interest, and, and for me, it just a lot of confusion, and I always appreciate the information you folks uh, give here uh, to give us guidance. Anyway, well, Joe, I, any last, go ahead. Yeah, I, so I, of course, first things first, I, I certainly appreciate the ability to contribute and, and hopefully be a help if and when this issue pops up to anybody joining here today. But um, yeah, Steve, you know, you probably make the, the most important point of the day where, um, you know, that this has kind of all been inflamed recently, this MSA issue, because of um, the, the change request that, that Medicare released in February and this, this date that's fast approaching in October. Um, and because this is all swirling around, you know, the, the, the facts of it is we're still not, you know, we have the, the kind of the goalpost has been moved on us a little bit because now they are saying they're going to be looking at or they're scrutinizing compliance on liability cases just like they do on comp claims now. Okay, fine. But yet they still have yet to give us clear guidance um, on how to do on how to do that, how go, to go about that. Um, and that's probably because liability settlements and comp claims are apples and oranges. Um, and you can't just cookie cutter over the guidance that we have in comp over to liability without creating a, a very negative ripple effect. So um, that's probably why it's been the holdup. That's probably why, um, you know, the proposed rules were pulled off the table in 14. Um, but the fact of the matter is, if you have a case that hits, you know, th that certain that Medicare is, is involved in some capacity and your case contemplates future medical care, something should be done. And I know everybody hates that because they just want a, a matter of fact, you know, answer, but it's something that should be done and it can look a number of different ways today. So that's a silver lining. Um, and, you know, hopefully we can be a service if uh, that issue pops up. And I, I know I hear all the time um, from folks um, in the, uh, working with personal injury settlements that MSAs are only required for workman's comp cases. But that's not really true, right? Yeah, so and yeah, so I'm glad you, you know you bring that up again. You know, like I mentioned earlier in the uh, presentation, um, it's kind of, you know, we we know what they mean when they ask that question, but it's technically not the right question because MSAs are never mandatory. In fact, if you look over the fence and, and peek over at work comp arena, MSAs aren't even mandatory in work comp claims. However, they, they're just done. If, it, if, if you know, Medicare is involved and it's contemplating future medical care in the settlement, they're just done. But yet, they're not mandatory. And it, it can you know, create a little bit of um, you know, uncertain. It, it can create some challenges when the, the right question isn't really asked. And that's the question should be, when do I have to protect Medicare's interest as a secondary payer? And from there, th that will be, those will be yes or no situations. And then from there you can say, okay, 
I can choose to do an MSA or some form of an MSA, but to start off immediately by saying, do I have to do an MSA or are they only for work comp? Um, it, you know, that's not quite the right question because the MSAs are just a means to an end. It's just a compliance tool. The, if, if certain triggers are hit, what we have to do, what we, are, what we must do is protect the Medicare um, as a secondary payer per that federal statute. So that's where people can get hung up on, do I, do I have to do MSAs? Um, but that's not, you know, that's not the whole story right there, if that makes sense. Anyway, with that, Joe, I'm going to thank you so much and uh, thank you for the uh, work that you do for the Golden State Pool Trust and administering our MSA uh, trust. And I really want to encourage folks. I, uh, I, I know I'm firing off questions to Joe all the time and his team, you know, about questions and that kind of thing. And I have uh, uh, relied on them a great deal when I have questions. And uh, so I would encourage you to keep track of Joe's email, and when you got those questions, uh, uh, here uh, the Medivest uh, team there is really on top of this, and uh, gives me the assurance that I'm up to date with this crazy area of the law that <laughs> really is just so confusing. So, anyway, thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. Okay.